Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. Energy poverty is a real thing right now. But not only is energy poverty a real thing, there are second order of magnitude of critical decisions in the industry space right now that are really having some horrible impacts on the disproportionately impacted communities. And if you've listened to my podcast, you know that I have a heart for those that are not always, uh, they're not making the decisions, however, they're trying to live. I've got two fun guests today. I've got Larry Glover. He's the CEO of the Glover Group, and he has been a friend of the podcast and has been on several times, and his podcast listens have gone nuts. Larry, thank you, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Stuart. I'm pleased to be here this morning. Uh, and I'll tell you, we the next one is a surprise. Uh, I've got Jack McGeever, and he uh, reached out to me after I saw his article that is quite amazing. The article is Chicago's clean and an affordable buildings ordinance is neither clean nor affordable. And that kind of hit what Larry and I have been working on, on all these kind of things. And it led to an organic discussion with uh, Larry and I. Jack, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. You know, as we were chit-chatting, getting ready, Larry, you started warming up into some fantastic questions. What were some of those questions? Well, I, well Stu, I, I was really interested in Jack's perspective and what drove him to look at the issues of Chicago and particularly around clean energy. And so... And now that I've had a chance to meet this young man and a sense of really how incredible he is, I'm even more interested in that approach for clean energy. Even though there are some things that he and I may not always agree on in, in terms of, of, of facts and, and the like, but I absolutely applaud a young person bringing a, a new perspective to this industry. So, yeah, um, I'd love to, to understand a little bit more about, about why this issue around affordability and around clean, because what we know is that the industry is talking tremendously about affordability. And what does affordability really mean? Is it the lowest price? Or is it the lowest burden? And how do we now start to look at those differences? So what are your yeah. thoughts, Jack? So Jack, if you if there's help us, help us share perspective yeah. with me. You know, I've lived in Chicago almost my entire life. Um, although I live in the suburbs now, I still like to think myself, you know, I've got the Chicago map right behind me. Um, but I love it. I love the city. I love the people here. Um, I think for me, obviously, as I was telling you guys before we got started, I've been interested in this for the last couple of years. And um, when I look at this new bill that's being proposed or ordinance, um, one of the things that I see as the main problem with it is essentially what this bill would, would do is effectively ban new homes and buildings from having the pipelines that provide energy. Um, that provide your electricity, that allow you to have a warm house in the cold winters we have here in Chicago, or for your air conditioning in the hot summer. Um, and so for me, the problem is they want to effectively ban natural gas use. And given that so much of our electricity comes from the from, comes from natural gas, I think that presents a really difficult problem because essentially what you'll be doing then is you'll be increasing the price of energy and electricity because if you're no longer using, um, if you're no longer using natural gas, you're going to be turning to other methods, and those methods are going to be things such as nuclear. Illinois is the largest producer of nuclear energy. We have more plants than anywhere else in the United States, according to the EIA. Um, when you look at coal, coal's dirtier than natural gas. Coal's dirtier than oil, right? So that's not. If our goal is to be clean, that's not the way to do it. 
Um, and if you look at like the other things, like I, the other sources, I don't think it's necessarily the best approach. And I think that when you look at the people of Chicago, um, the median income isn't necessarily high enough to afford what the increase would be should we ban natural gas, right? And so you're gonna have people who can't afford that, that energy after we ban natural gas because the prices are gonna skyrocket. And I think it's really unfair. It's a really dangerous situation to put people in. Yeah. Let me come back and, and talk a little bit about this, this sense of displaced energy supply. And, and to, the, to the degree, I agree with you that the ban on natural gas does create an unusual burden on customers. One, because you need gas in order to, in order to produce electricity. So there is, there is this dependency that, that, is, that is clearly there. But the other... And I think to your point in the article that if you remove gas from the equation, you have to fill it with something else. Right. Um, and you talked about wind and what's the growing contribution of wind, right. um, the impact of nuclear. But we know that in, in Illinois, that nuclear is running somewhere close to its peak load proficiency, somewhere in the high 90s. In, in terms of low proficiency. So that source is probably almost tapped out. You right. talk about wind, you talk about coal. We know we're moving quickly away from coal because of all of those other properties. Right. It's interesting, you did not talk about solar. Was that purposeful or was that something that you didn't think fit with your equation? I think a little bit of both. I think that it doesn't necessarily fit, at least in the context of Illinois. You look at California and Arizona, maybe. Here in Illinois, specifically Chicago, where this bill is proposed, it's not realistic. Um, if you're transporting renewable energy, it's much more, um, sorry, it's much more expensive than if you're transporting non-renewable energy. And so, again, that just goes to increase the price. And I think that when you look at the way that Illinois gets its power, it's not from um renewables i might i might suggest though that that in this energy transition space we have to look at all fuels and even though chicago is a midwestern city and 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 you don't have sun as much as you do california and, and arizona but there continue to be opportunities for solar right now solar is probably somewhere about eight to 10% of our energy resource. The goal of that sector is to get it up to 20% by 2035. So it has to become a viable fuel source beyond just our, 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 um, our, our, our um, um, estates with, with heavy sun. Um, mm -hmm. Solar, I believe is a viable uh, product for markets like Chicago. And to your um, to your example, when you displace gas, solar is a fuel that is less costly, greater impact on the grid, um, lower carbon emissions, and so it does represent a I think a qualified fuel for us to to join in. Um, but yes, so I see solar for one, but I also ask that as we try and, as we move to this transition, to this energy transition, we're looking at transportation, we're looking at, at distributed energy resources where we can now begin to build these virtual power plants because we have solar and, and rooftop solar and battery storage and, and new technology, so when you, when you put that that com combination together, you do get a greater impact and lower cost. And what should impact as a lower burden on on those lower uh, low to moderate income consumers. How do you how do you see 
see that in terms of impacting the burden um, without gas or, or, or with this ban on gas? I see that if you ban gas, like I said in the article, you're going to have to replace it with something. Um, and when you look at what the projections are for solar projects, like you said, we're trying to increase its capacity. And that's not going to happen when this bill gets passed. If it does get passed, I'm hoping it doesn't. But if it does, the solar um, energy and renewable energies are not where we need them to be in order to meet that need and that gap that would be created by um, the banning of natural gas, right? So I think that that price increase is imminent. As soon as you ban natural gas, that price, those prices are going to skyrocket. Um, I think that long term, absolutely, I agree with you. It needs to be a mix of all different sources. Um, but for the foreseeable next five, 10, maybe even 15 years, I don't think that renewables such as wind and solar, where we need them to be, particularly in Chicago, could it be a reliable source down the line? Absolutely. And I'm not going to disagree with anybody about that. I just don't see it being a reliable energy source as far as cost goes within the next five to 10 years. Let me let me add this one here, guys, because I think wind is absolutely having some horrific problems right now. Uh, it, you know, you, you look at uh, uh, the number of folks that are uh, not able to make them work because they're not sustainable. I think solar does have extra legs that wind doesn't. Uh, the hot button I have, uh, Larry and Jack, is that the renewable, um, the solar is not as uh, uh, recyclable yet. The finances aren't there. And that's that's one of my, oh, we really got to get that one fixed. Now, the other one is in the housing areas versus the uh, buildings. I want your opinion on both of the on both of your opinions. Is that on solar rooftops for homes? It makes sense, except there is a gigantic problem with um, not so honorable folks going around installing uh, solar panels on roofs, and they're selling the. Oh, is it the uh, uh, really weird financial uh, deals on those things? And we got charlagans running around selling those things. So, Larry, if a, if we had a really good government program, I don't like subsidies. That's one that I would do to offset the costs. But I the charlatans, I want to drag them out in the street and beat the snot out of them. <laughs> I. I so I, I think what we've experienced yep. is this idea that I call open gate marketing. Okay. Because as solar first began, the goal for almost all of those companies was get as much out there as you can, as quickly right. as you can, get it up on the roof. And the belief that once it's there, it will continue to get stronger. In that unique feeding frenzy of trying to sell as much as you can, right. we know that you're always going to have bad actors who are going to be right. part of it. And any new product that gets into the marketplace, the bad actors normally happen in the early end, along with the early adopters, because there's a greater willingness for risk. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so so that becomes an opportunity. I think when industries begin to mature, as solar is now having to mature because it's part of a bigger mix, they also got to fix the little clinks in there. And I think most of the solar companies are working really, really hard to get these bad actors out of the game. It's hard, you know, because when you look at who owns their home, they're generally a little older, they're, they're generally um, people who have worked for a long time to, to, to create this asset. And so they are being preyed on or have been preyed on. Um, but that's also part of this new legislation. For example, the administration uh, last month offered some legislation around um, solar financing that had consumer protection um, oh, nice. written into it for that very reason, 
So, so yeah, the other thing that I might say is that I don't want us to, to believe that once a, a category, once a product is introduced, that you're going to get the benefits of scale. Because that, I think, is what we're talking about. So if we talk about, if, if we look at solar in the next three to five years, it's not going to be up to scale. So you're not going to get those benefits. But if we're planning this transition in the long term, which it is, and now we're talking 2030, 2035, which is the mark on the wall that everybody's talking about. Right. Now you have the ability to get it to scale so that it's cost are manageable and controllable. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're looking at how to integrate solar as part of this this portfolio of products not only for commercial but for residential so you're going to have some gas you need to have gas pipelines i'm going to have gas pipeline I, they're, they're not they're not going to get me to be totally electric right um but i think it all does make make sense and 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 and, and jack I, I'd, I'd like to hear your perspective because i think you look at the hourglass from a from a different um, vantage point that I do, um, and and to say, how do you protect those vulnerable consumers in the midst of new hydrogen, which is going to cost more, mm -hmm. wind, which is really it's going to cost more, right. and and all underpinned by the fact that when you add all of this technology and all of this stuff to the cost of energy, we're going to use so much more energy mm -hmm. and the cost is not going to be less. It's going to be more expensive. And so how do we now kind of blend that in your, in your eyes to, to make those costs equitable? Mm -hmm. You know, firstly, I think you bring up a good point is that the cost, it's not cheap, right? Renewable energy is really expensive, um, both in the short term and the long term. I um, I think it's important to protect people. And I don't think that um, putting legislation in place, such as the city of Chicago is trying to do right now, um, protects those people and those more vulnerable populations. I think that when you look at specifically and the, through the lens of energy, I think it needs to be what is most cost effective and what is most fiscally responsible. And for me, I don't see in the short term um, renewable energy sources maybe checking that box. Um, I think when you look at the losses that wind farms are taking right now, they're doing Um When you're looking at solar, as I said, the cost of solar panels is instrumentally, like it's insurmountable, it's huge. Um, and that's not affordable for the small mom and pops. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think that that cost is maybe necessary is not the word, but I don't think it's needed right now, at least. I don't think that we should be taking on those costs right now. I don't think the research is there yet. And I don't think the cost has come down yet. Well, I um, think the research is getting there. And I think that the cost benefit is a benefit derived from scale. And we, we just aren't there yet. Scale and legislation. I mean, the, the whole issue of net zero and, and, and for solar, for example, and that, that goes back to the grid, you know, how, how do you manage those costs, that, that net zero impact? That's one of the issues around solar. You're going to have some of the same kinds of things for wind and, and the, the, the expense of wind and the repair of those blades and 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 those retractors, um, they have a they have a lifespan on them that's right. ten to twelve years, I believe. Eight. Eight. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. serious. Um, yeah. I've been running that down, and no, and I have not had anything uh, saying no. And wind is and everything i'm finding uh larry and jack is that wind is unsustainable from day one fiscally um and you take a look at the offshore wind farms they're even more horrible um mm -hmm. and like i said i believe solar's got a lot more legs now 
uh, from a personal standpoint, guys, I'm putting solar on my roof. I've also got a wind, uh, wind. Um, I I'm serious. I, if I talk about it, I want to sit there and have numbers and I'm putting a windmill on the top of the house. And I also have, uh, two propane tanks and two generators and I can run any of my four buildings here uh, off of all of that. Now, it's called being energy independent. <laughs> yes. Now, here's the problem. It's expensive. So, you know, I, I'm sitting here. I can't, I don't want to talk about it, you know, guys, if I can't prove it. And, and um, now. Is it going to be affordable for everybody? Um, Larry, I, I really want it to be. Um, and in California, I need help trying to find somebody. So any of our podcast listeners today, if you're from California, the regulatory issues in California are not, they sold it to California as if you put it on your roof, you can make money off of it. And then when you make money off of it, it'll be sold back and forth but you're having to pay for the amount of time that it's remaining idle or the backup sources. And so they're now taking money away from the homeowners and it is not profitable based off of the balancing authorities trying to balance all this stuff out. So uh, Larry, I guys, Jack, I, I would like to put our heads together and see if we can't come up with some right ideas and solutions because it would make sense uh to distribute the costs if the benefits could be shared back out to the distribute disproportionately impacted communities because right now the costs are spread across the board and the disproportionately impacted communities are paying a higher larry i think you call it the uh energy burden and yes they, and they have a higher energy burden Let's figure out a way to uh, take advantage of the solar and reduce that energy burden because it doesn't seem fair. Is that a is that a fair statement? Oh, that was a good pun. Yeah. <laughs> good, Jack. You were going to say something. Um, I I think it's really important what Stuart shared earlier that what you're doing, somebody who's less fortunate might not have the ability to do. Um, and so I think that, at least for me, from what I'm thinking right now, I think that the best way to go about it would be start more locally. Um, right now, when you look at what California is doing, or when you look at uh, Chicago legislation, I actually think it'd be better if you were to break it up into smaller, um, almost neighborhoods, maybe is the right way to look at it. Um, and then each neighborhood shares, let's say, um, a set of solar panels or a wind turbine in the middle of them. And that's how they draw their energy, right? And so, at least for me, the problem that presents them is you're going to have energy inequality in different areas of the country, right? Because different climates, different um, types of weather is going to mess with that. I, um, Larry, I think you were calling that uh, microgrids. And what did you also, uh, uh, what was your other term? Absolutely. Here? Well, there's, so when, when we look at, and let me back up. I like the your idea of smaller sectors and looking at energy sources almost from a community base. But given the interdependencies that we see, grid dependencies, and when you when you add a new fuel source to the grid, your infrastructure now changes, and so you have to upgrade your your grid that adds that adds cost to, to the process. You also, I think, begin to look at at what fuels can be localized. You know, solar is one of them. Wind to a degree, but wind gets into the the um gets into the grid system. I'm sorry. When it gets into the grid system and you don't know where it comes from, except that it, it's a little cost. Um, for me, I look at issues like solar and say, 
how can I build a, a community solar program that does include small and medium-sized commercial buildings, hmm. does include residential buildings, and and how and and when you aggregate those costs and then reallocate them, I think there is a way to lower the burden on everyone because you reallocate those costs and. If I am a if I'm a consumer, then I don't have to pay thirty thousand dollars to get solar on my roof, but I can participate in a rebate program because we have community solar and I'm a subscriber to community solar, which helps to lower my cost. All of those are little things that we we should be doing and 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 uh, that make a real impact. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and Larry, that's a great point. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. And Jack, um, it it is also one of the things about uh, a lot of the incentives for uh, folks is the tax incentives, but the disproportionately impacted folks don't have that tax issue. So you know that we're paying all this money in tax incentives. We got to figure out a whole new thing. So. Maybe getting some legislators and some ideas, Larry. Um, you, maybe you already thought of this. Yeah, legis well, legislation absolutely has to be a key part of all of these discussions. Right. Um, it is, we have to figure out from a legislative standpoint, and you look at folks like California, and, it, and they're trying to figure out how to redistribute the cost so that low income, low to moderate income consumers um, get some greater benefit. The challenge that they have is that the programs that they've initiated um, look at income as a base, um, and it, it, it's more of a handout program than a, a savings through efficiency program. The, the, I, I absolutely believe that when we just find ways to say you're low income and so let's just take 10% off the top of your bill and you are, you are fine. For me, it doesn't make you a better energy consumer. I'm a big believer that let me help you understand your energy use. Let me under help you understand the tools that are available for you to manage your energy cost and burden. And I'd rather teach you how to do that and take and spend another two years of teaching you how to become a better energy consumer mm -hmm. than jumping to the end and giving you subsidies for two years and after that two years you're still a bad energy consumer <laughs> expending more than you need to using stuff inefficiently yeah. and and no greater long-term benefit so i'm a real proponent in energy education and education for the purpose of helping people to reduce their burden. I think we can teach people how to reduce their burden and not pay their way out of lower burden because it doesn't, the net effect is not a lower burden. It's just a higher cost on everybody. Well, Larry, I love that. Um, we got about two more minutes here, guys, maybe even three, but uh, Jack, give us your last words and what's coming around the corner for, for Jack here. Um. For me personally, I'm uh, I'm I'm looking ahead for the next five years. Um, I'm currently involved in discussions online on LinkedIn. I've had the opportunity to work with a few grassroots organizations, so I'm really heavy involved in policy from a grassroots perspective. Namely, the two organizations I'm most involved with are first Turning Point USA, if you're familiar with it, and secondly, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, and so I hope to grow my involvement in both of those and the different ways that I can. 
Um, I'm very interested in policy, and I think that these discussions are incredibly important. I really appreciate being here with you guys today. Um, and with the next five years hold, I'm not really sure. I've applied to colleges, and I'm going really hard for a few. Um, but whatever it brings, I'm ready for it. I, uh, I love the challenge, and I love the possibilities that lie ahead for me. Oh, that's cool. Larry, I, I, I'd give you a hug right now, but, uh, you know, what are your last thoughts? What's coming around the corner for the Glover gr gl group? Well, I yes. can't get that out. Yeah, two quick things. Jack, it has absolutely been my pleasure to talk with you this afternoon. I applaud you for, for your perspective, but for your willingness to just take on this big, big issue. And I look forward to some other secondary discussions that we might have that might talk about the research and the, and the like. Um, guys, I think we are at a critical point in time in our world for energy transition. Mm -hmm. And there are three issues for me that I think are absolutely critical. Okay. One is resiliency. And, and as we build our way through resiliency, which means that we've seen weather impacted um, conditions over the last three to five years. And it happens. And these communities, these low to moderate income communities have to be as resilient to recover from those disasters as our most affluent communities. And when we don't do that, we do everyone a disservice. So for me, as we go forward and I look at transition issues, transportation, grid revitalization, workforce development, um, EV evolution, electrification, I think we have to look at all of those with an eye that's not 2025, but 2035 and 2050. And, and that's when we will really realize the benefits of all this transition work. We're gonna have a tough time over the next five to 10 years because energy is gonna get more expensive. We're gonna use more of it. We're introducing technology which shifts all of the boundaries, but at some point it's gonna level out. So I think we have to be able to see ourselves in, in its fullness before we evaluate how difficult it is for us right now. It always is difficult in the front. It's always going to cost more until we get to scale and get to process that aligns us with some equitable distribution of these costs. I think that's where we are. So for me, it is going forward and trying to influence the, the long-term planning for our companies and particularly for LMI communities. Oh, man. What a great conversation today, guys. I just can't begin to tell you how much I appreciate both of your times. I'll have both of your LinkedIn's and contact info in the show notes. And uh, with that, thank you guys very much. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here today.